long since we've had a new giant globe? The Unisphere from the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair? Eartha, the Delorme Globe from 1998 in Maine? The Nature Research Center of the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, opening in April 2012, in some ways tops them both. 50% bigger than Eartha, far more detailed than the Unisphere, and directly applying cutting-edge satellite data brought into crystal imagery by satellite mosaic pioneer Robert Stacy, the Daily Planet is a 70-foot diameter globe that may be the largest representational globe in the world. Inside, the globe will be a three-story interactive multimedia and performance space with the usual digital pyrotechnics. But the best part of the Daily Planet, for those of us in love with maps and globes, is the outside. Turning that satellite data of the surface of the Earth into a mathematical representation of a sphere comprising 56 gores, or longitudinal slices, globe makers Todd and Bill Ulrich apply the surface of the globe to the daily planet using the kind of stickers companies use to make graphics that stay on 18-wheelers traveling 70 miles per hour in the rain, using a spray-on solvent to enable them to move the stickers, then squeegeeing them into final position. As they've worked, they've already seen the value of a globe. Well, we've had people come up to us and say, what is that? What are we looking at? And it's South America or Africa, the continent itself, the shape. And people would ask what that is. And it's truly representative of they don't know that that's the continent of Africa or South America. It's not that's depressing, and general geography is good. But a globe like this also helps dispel widespread and unconsidered map biases. Museum director Betsy Bennett says she is already approached by people telling her the scale of the map is all wrong. The first continent the Ulrich has applied on the globe was Africa, so it's fitting that cartographers call this the Africa problem. That is, people are used to seeing flat maps of the world. Flat maps usually have either England or the United States in the middle, which tends to represent Asia as two pieces. More, the Mercator projection we're all used to seeing vastly overexpresses the size of the northern hemisphere and underexpresses the southern, making Greenland look about the size of Africa. But it's not that accurate a representation. Not that accurate at all. There's been great discussions about what should replace Mercator as our, as our map of choice. And we haven't decided yet. I think that uh, I think that the uh, the National Geographic uh, maybe settled on uh, Miller or perhaps Robinson projection. Um, see them used a bit more often these days. In fact, getting beyond flat maps was how the Ulrichs first got involved in globe making. We started out working with the Buckminster Fuller Institute, and in combination, WorldSat International with a first globes we produced were icosahedrons, 20-sided platonic geometry. And now the Ulrichs are working on the Daily Planet, which just might be the largest representative globe in the world. The Delorme Globe in Maine, the world's largest spinning globe, is only 40 feet in diameter, and the planet is more than 70. And the Unisphere from the New York World's Fair in 1964 is much larger, but is a piece of sculpture, not a globe. In fact, Todd Ulrich sees the Daily Planet as a lot more than a nice general educational tool. With its 200-meter imagery, the globe is actually a gigantic scientific instrument. Like maps, even globes have inaccuracies and misapprehensions. They are as much a record of the perception of the Earth at the moment they are created as they are an objective representation of reality. Consider, for example, the Maparium in Boston, a huge inside-out stained glass globe. Not just a lovely piece of art, the Maparium is also a record of how the world was perceived in 1935. Even so, the Daily Planet. For example, it shows all the land of the world. But what about icebergs? What about silk patterns at river mouths? What about tiny islands? If there was a piece of land, an island, documented in this global Landsat mosaic that we've left it every time, it's, uh, this is a, it's a measure of science here that we're trying to exact and uh, also figuring that there's probably explorers and people that are doing research that are coming here to the Nature Research Center and uh, some off chance that their research focused on a, a small island. So we wanted to leave everything on there and these are all these little, little artifacts that you see that are basically very small stickers with islands left in them. So we're being very exacting about placement and, and inclusion.
we're, we're, we're again approaching this from a, you know, a purist standpoint with science in that if there are artifacts in the, in the imagery captured by the, uh, the satellites, we feel like they tell a story. And so the satellites actually peer beneath the water, so we're actually showing coral reefs. We also made a decision to leave a lot of phytoplankton blooms, which are evident. And we feel like that the scientists here at the, the Nature Center will be able to focus on those. I suspect there'll be a lot of groups out here with spotting scopes and laser pointers and, and being able to uh, point out these artifacts and let them, let them tell a story. It's the biggest story in the world. It is the world. And now we've got a new one.